Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you for virtually joining us. On behalf of ACE, I'd like to welcome you to our program tonight as we celebrate the birth of the savior of humanity, our leader and the imam of our time, Imam al hujja al-Mahdi ajalallah farajah. We will begin with a recitation of the Holy Quran and Dua'i Faraj by Brother Zohair Hosseini. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First and foremost, I'd like to send my congratulations to those watching the stream as well as all of humanity on the birth anniversary of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajurullah Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. Inshallah, we'll begin with the recitation. A few verses from Surah Al Zumar and Dua Faraj. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسيق الذين اتقوا رب بهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم سلام عليكم طبتم فدخلوا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسيق الذين اتقوا حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء حيث نشاء فنعم أجر العاملين وترى الملائكة حا Oh. 
وقضي بينهم بالحق وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين صدق الله العلي اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد إلهي عظم البلاء وبرح الخفاء وانكشف الغطاء وضاقت الأرض ومنعت السماء وإليك يا رب المشتكى وعليك المعول في الشدة والرخاء اللهم صل على محمد وآله الذين فرضت علينا طاعته فعرفتنا بذلك منزلتهم فرج عنا بحقهم فرجا عاجلا كلمح البصر أو هو أقرب يا محمد يا علي يا علي يا محمد انصراني فإنكما ناصراي وكفياني فإنكما كافيان يا مولاي يا صاحب الزمان الغوف 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 أدركني 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 هل عجل العجل يا مولاي يا صاحب الزمان وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين الله صل على محمد وآل محمد Thank you, Brother Zuhair, for that beautiful recitation. May Allah bless you. Before we continue, due to technical difficulties, I'd like to apologize for the delay with getting our program started. We'd like to extend our sincere congratulations to all the followers of the Imam, especially all of you on this joyous occasion. This past year has been especially difficult for us all. As we celebrate this grand birth anniversary and these blessed nights of Shaban, it is a great opportunity to reflect on how we're preparing ourselves and the world for the reappearance of our Imam. Let us renew our pledge to him and our efforts to hasten his arrival, for in it lies the salvation of humanity. In continuation of our celebrations for the birth anniversary of Imam Mahdi, Ajalallah, Farah, Faraja. We have a lecture this Thursday night with Syed Asad Jafri. We hope you can join us at 9 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're honored to be joined by Haj Hassanain Rajabali. Haj Hassanain is a graduate from the University of Colorado with a degree in molecular biology and psychology. He was previously based in New York, where he was principal of the Tawheed Institute and also ran a successful internet company. He currently runs the WISE Academy and is the director of Camp Taha in Columbiaville, Michigan. From, what, from wherever you're watching our program tonight, 
I'd like to request for you to recite a loud salawat as we welcome Haj Hassanin for his lecture. نعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاه والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش افضل الانبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا ابي القاسم محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين I begin in Allah's name, the Beneficent, the Merciful, and I congratulate the human race for this fantastic news of the birth of our blessed Imam 255 years after the migration of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina. And he has been among us, evolving with the human race for the past 1200 plus years. And I think it's a blessing when we examine the uh, gift that Allah has given us through guidance of prophets, through guidance of scriptures, and of course, through guidance and protection of the Imams. And in celebrating the birth of our living Imam, it's crucial to understand that leadership is very important if we're to succeed in this very difficult world that is filled with confusion. And we live a world, we live in a world today where truth is proposed but actually it's not the whole truth. It's what we call white lies. And we've got leadership today that is so pervasive, invasive, and so dangerous that it actually takes our uh, freedoms away. And it's designed to make us immoral, if not amoral. And it's designed for us to become robotic creatures that will simply fulfill the wish of those elite few you know, two to 5% of the world's population. So let's understand the gravity of this gift that Allah has given us with the birth of the Imam. And I'll just stress on the history of how the Imam uh, was, was brought up into, uh, brought into this world. As you know, the, after the Khilafah of Imam Ali alayhi salam, after the usurpation of the Khilafah, the Umayyads essentially got power and they dominated the world of Islam under leaderships that, uh, such as Muawi and Yazid that had just very evil consequences. It led to Karbala. And then as you know, after about 89 years of um, uh, empowerment by the Umayyads, we find that they were removed and the Abbasid Empire took over. And the Abbasid Empire did it under the guise of taking revenge against the tyranny that uh, Yazid did in Karbala. And what's interesting is that they were no better, if not worse, than the Umayyads against the family of the Prophet, though they used the family of the Prophet as a way to validate the usurpation of the Khilafah. And he found them to be vicious. And our you know, Imams on the fifth Imam, sixth Imam, seventh Imam continued to suffer it had reached such levels of oppression against the followers of Ahlul Bayt that Mu'tasim and Mu'tamid, and these were the sort of the last caliphs of the Abbasid Empire, had put a very tight grip on the family of the Prophet. And we need to understand what was this tight, tight grip. They all knew from the very beginning that there will come a child that will be born who will be the Redeemer, the Mahdi. Now, the messianic principle is actually universal on earth. If you, if you study all major religions in the world, they all have some messianic concept, whether it's to come and redeem this world till the day of judgment or to cyclically do it, such as in Buddhism, where every thousand years you have a Buddha who is born enlightened that will guide the human race. So the notion of a redeemer, the Mahdi, the Messiah, the messianic principle is very prevalent in all major religions. And they all knew <clears throat> that there shall come a child who will destroy these evil empires. And the caliphs of the time knew that if this child were born, that maybe this child would destroy them. So what they started to do was to find any woman who was pregnant, 
within the family of the Prophet and to essentially kill them. This is very similar to what happened in the time of Moses, alayhi salam, Musa, where the Pharaoh knew that the, um, a child will be born among the children of Israel, and this child is going to essentially dethrone the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh said, every firstborn male among the Bani Israel should be killed because Pharaoh decided he was going to put a stop to this. And of course, miraculously, the mother of Moses gave birth to Musa miraculously. In fact, they say that when she was pregnant, there was no sign of carrying a child. So the mother of Moses miraculously carried Moses in such a way that if anybody examined her, it would appear that she's not carrying a child. But Moses was born miraculously. And by Allah's will, as you know, Moses was raised in the house of the Pharaoh as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards those who challenge the way of God. And Allah clearly shows that if you're going to play with my plans, I will certainly destroy you in the sense that if you play with my plans against me. And as we know, historically, the Pharaoh was drowned by the very same Moses. So the story is very similar to Imam Mahdi salam, where Imam Mahdi's birth was very secretive. So Imam Hassan Askari, as you know, sends a servant to purchase a slave woman. As you know, the Roman Empire had been defeated and the family of the emperor were taken and they were being sold in the slave market. And the Imam specifically chooses the mother of Imam Mahdi, whose name was Nargis, and her name was Susan. She had many different titles, but Najis is her general name, as we know. And she was hidden. The one who owned her in the sale had hidden her because she was a very special woman. And Imam Hassan Askari sends his servant and says, there's a specific woman that I want you to free and bring her to me. And when he goes to the slave owner, the slave owner was surprised that this servant knew about this hidden woman. And the woman, Najis, actually had received a very vivid dream with Isa alayhi salam in the dream in Maryam, essentially telling her that your obligation now is to unite with your distant cousin and to bring about the finality of the, uh, uh, the Messiah, al masih Al-Qayyim. As you know, Imam Mahdi has got many names. He is known as Al-Qayyim, the one who stands. He is known as al hujja the one who is a witness. And um, he's known as Al-Mahdi, the one who guides. So we have many titles of Imam Mahdi, alayhi salam. And it's important for us to know how he was born. So she marries Imam Hassan Askari, and she now conceives this child. And this child is without sign because the aunt of Imam Hassan Askari visits Imam Hassan Askari, her name was Hakima, and she's asking, she's speaking to Imam Hassan Askari, her, uh, her nephew, and he says to her that soon that Redeemer which the Holy Prophet promised, whose name is like his, because the Prophet said, the one who shall come, his name shall be mine, and his resemblance like, shall be like mine, and he will even look like me, his character will be like me, and his um, appearance and, and everything about him will be very similar to me. So she's surprised and she says, when is this going to happen? And Imam Hassan Askari says to her, very soon, but you are one of the few witnesses that will witness his birth and most people will not be aware of it and he will be born in secret. So she goes to uh, Najis, the mother of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, and notices that she has no sign of a child. And she goes back to Imam Hassan Askari and says, how is that possible? There is no sign of, a, of her carrying a baby. So the Imam says, by the miracle of God, he is hidden because the enemy would love to destroy him and Allah is protecting him. And as a result of that, um, he is going to be born secretly. But you, my aunt, are going to be one of those witnesses. And miraculously within a short time, uh, you know, Lady Najis 
gives birth to uh, Lady Hakima. I mean, gives birth to uh, Imam Zain al Abidin. My apologies, Imam Saibu Zaman. And you find that he is secretly born and hidden, and nobody knows about it. So this was his birth. And then history shows that as soon as he was born, Imam Hassan Askari recites the Adhan in, in the right ear and Iqam on the left ear. And Imam is very pleased and very happy. And they say the angelic beings were also praising the, the blessings, just like when the Prophet was born. And you find that within that period of time, this young child is hidden and the Imam starts to spread the news only among the pious believers that the Mahdi has been born. This was 250 years after the Prophet migrated from Mecca to Medina. And the Imam Hassan Askari was telling the, his companions, the followers, that obey him. He is the Imam, obey him, and he is going to be your guide, but take advantage of him for a short period of time for he will be in occultation for a long period of time until when Allah decrees and he will return and bring about equity on earth. And it's fascinating because when this child was born, the blessed Imam and Imam Hassan Askari was holding him on his lap with his hands. And the baby, the first thing the baby recited was Surah Al-Qasas, verse number five, وَنُرِيدُ this is in the fifth verse of the 28th chapter. You find that there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is our desire to make you oppressed, the inheritors and the leaders. And this is something that is the will of Allah. And Imam Mahdi is actually now reciting this as proof that he is going to be the one who will accomplish this. And Imam Hassan Askari was very delighted to see this child already on that mission. And you might say that um, as a young child reciting, how is that possible? Well, we know that even Isa in the cradle recited his declaration of prophethood. He declared his prophethood, declared his servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, declared that he is bringing the scripture. This is Jesus I'm talking about. And he declared it all in front of the public as a newborn baby. So Imam Mahdi salam, is now declaring that I am the one who is the redeemer. But Allah has a unique position for Imam Mahdi. And I want to discuss that briefly. Why was he born 255 years after Hijra, you know, for 12 centuries? Why not be born today or tomorrow? Our brothers of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah believe that the same Mahdi will be exactly as we say in the Shia world. The difference is they say he is not born yet, or he will be born, or he will be born just before his mission starts. But their argument is that between the time of the Prophet and until the birth of Imam Mahdi, essentially, there is no divine agency uh, declared by Allah. As you know, the Caliphate was chosen by the people from the Sunni school of thought. So this agency that people have no jurisdiction over starts after the Prophet and comes back, comes to this period now. We, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Shia said, no. The representation of God chosen by Allah was immediately with the Prophet, after the Prophet, continuously till the Day of Judgment. And that the Imam, the 12th Imam was born and he has remained among us. And Allah has kept him young. Now, the question people ask is, how is he remaining young for 1,200 years plus? How is that possible? Well, first of all, please understand that Allah keeps creations existing for eternity if he wants to. Let's look at Iblis. Shaitan has been alive for tens of thousands of years. He worshipped Allah for 6,000 years per our understanding. And he's been with us ever since. And the human race is at least 20, 30, 40,000 years old. So how is that possible that he has remained within that context of time? And for somebody to ask that how is it that Allah will keep somebody alive for such a period of time? Quran says even no, a prophet who preached for 950 years 
you know, centuries ago, kept him alive for, for a long period of time. So this question of how is the Imam living for such a long period of time is really a moot question. It doesn't hold much water. Secondly, the question that is asked is why, what is the meaning behind him being among us from uh, for so, such a long period of time? Well, you know, he's the hujja, he's the witness. And when he comes and establishes justice on earth, he will have witnessed centuries of human misbehavior, the rise and falls of civilization. And he will be a witness to it. He will say, I was there. I was there when Genghis Khan came. I was there, you know, when these empires came. I was there when the Western Empire, I was there when the British usurped. I was there when the Ottoman Empire. And the Imam says, I'm a witness to all of these um, human uh, civilizations that came and fell. And that's fantastic. Imagine somebody's talking to you and says, 600 years ago, I was in this region and this king did this and I was there and I saw it. That's the, that's the witness of the Imam al-Hujjah, which is bar none, I think the greatest um, gift, if you really think about it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed among us and given us the opportunity to have a leader who has incredible amount of history. Imagine we have a, imagine right now Imam Mahdi alayhi salam uh, is among us, which he will be inshallah soon. And when you talk to him, you're not talking to him about today. He will tell you what happened a thousand years ago. And he will tell you a thousand years ago, I was there and this is what happened and this is what a said and B said, and there'll be no lies. Just think about that. Unheard of in history. For if a leader was born today, he would say, well, I'm oblivious of the fact of what happened 50 years ago or 100 years ago. You know, I'm not aware of the internet revolution. I'm not even aware of how computers were, you know, were designed. I mean, I see computers now, but I didn't live through the technology or the, through the Renaissance. I didn't live through World War I or World War, through, or World War II. I have no idea. I didn't live through the Islamic Revolution of the uh, you know, Islamic Republic of Iran. I, I'm not aware of that. I, I'm hearing it. I've read through historical books. That's vastly different from a leader who's telling you I was there. So that's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the reasons Allah has kept him. Another reason is Allah never, ever, puts the human race on earth to be tested with guidance and allow the human race to remain on earth for a millisecond without his agent on earth. That is why Adam is the first prophet of God. He's not only the first human being, he's the first prophet of God, meaning he's the agent of God and nobody can be before him. That means he's a prophet first and then a human being. SubhanAllah. And the Prophet has said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if there are two human beings left on earth, one will be my agent. Meaning Allah never leaves the human race without a designated, appointed leader. And when Allah declared to the angels that I am placing on earth my Khalifa. Ja'ilun here meaning always, not with Adam, but Adam, his progeny, one after another, Nurun ala nur, yahdi lahu li nurihi man yasha. Allah guides light upon light, and he guides them to the light wherever he wills. Which implies very importantly that the Imam had to be born when Imam Hassan Askari died, became Shaheed, because otherwise there'd be a gap, a millisecond gap of a non leader on earth. And Allah has promised, if there is no leader of his on earth, he will destroy this earth because it will negate the very purpose of why we were created. So leadership is central. And in today's world, we have to acknowledge the kind of leadership, not just in praising them and giving them credit, but leadership in its fullest fruition is when we emulate them and follow them. Well, in kuntum Allah, if you claim to love Allah, Allah says to the Prophet, tell them to follow you. Then Allah will love you. So Allah says, who are they? They are the ones who obey Allah. Then Allah says, 
وجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم في سبيل الله أولئك هم الصادقون so Allah is saying very clearly that who are the believers? They believe in Allah, the messenger, not his leadership and they don't doubt and they do everything for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this conversation is to teach us all the importance of the living imam put it in our hearts don't question it understand it understand the gravity of it understand the importance of it because it is central to the human race it is central to our success to give you some examples look at the leadership we just had in the white house right I mean, with all due respect, it was moronic, right? Now, Trump did some good things, but he was moronic. I mean, world leaders were laughing under their teeth. But look what happened to the world. Racism became extremely prevalent. Black lives were being attacked. Now Asians are being attacked full, full, full swing. You look or you resemble an Asian, you know? A president who names a disease that's a pandemic that's global, and while it may have originated from China, but to, to generalize it in a stereotypic negative way and call it Kung flu or give it some terrible name and then blame it on the Asians, that these illiterate, ignorant Americans go now and put swast you know, swastikas, they put all kinds of paintings on the doors of these poor Asians who've been here longer than many European Americans who, ha who, are, who are more patriotic and have fought in more battles in World War I and World War II are now being vilified just because they look Asian. How does that come among this, among a country that is, really, is the most powerful country in the world? How do you have its citizens doing the dumbest things on earth that even third world country citizens will not do? Leadership. When you have a moronic leadership, when you have a foolish leader who says, you know, take some Lysol or whatever, I mean, when you have something like that, Allah says, Afaman kana mu'minan, kaman kana fasiqan, la yastawun. Can you compare a believer and a fasiq, a troublemaker, an idiot, a fool? Can you compare them? Afaman yamshi mukibban ala wajhihi ahda, amman yamshi sawiyan ala sirat mustaqim. Can you compare? The one who puts his face on the ground like a material creature who's like a, a lolling dog, always having his nose on the ground. Allah says, is that the same as the one who's upright, moral? Now, all you need is one leader who gets on the pulpit and 300 million people or a billion people are watching and he makes one incendiary comment and it resonates in thousands of people who then take guns and start indiscriminately shooting and killing and thousands and thousands of lives are lost. And then you have these blind followers, you know, millions of them following blindly with the Pied Piper to take them into the gallows. Leadership, it's very important brothers and sisters of the world, choose your leaders correctly. For if we arbitrarily choose our leaders, they will do the dumbest things and cause wars like Hitler, who caused the death of 60 million people. There are some countries that are 10 million people. 60 is like multiple countries. Can you imagine annihilating the entire population? Killing one person is massive. Imagine 60 million people dead because a man thought that the white race, the Aryan race is superior to every race and he needed to cleanse ethnically and er eradicate anything that came in its way. And he built the biggest machinery of war that led to 60 million people, unfortunately dying that some suffered with PTSD till their death. For what reason? And Allah said, they're coming back to me and I'm going to show them how foolish they were, that I gave them such honor and I had angels bow to them. And instead of honoring the honor that I gave them, they created mischief, dahar al-fasad. Mankind has created fitna, facade, instead of being good. So this conversation in congratulating the human race is thank God 
that if I was living in a world knowing that such morons can become presidents and can become kings, and you go to South America, you've got leaders and presidents and kings who are morons on earth today, who want nothing but to kill people and dismember them using bone saws in embassies. And they're pontificating with their billions of dollars and their private jets, thinking that they own the world. Can you imagine, and if I thought in my mind, that these are the only kinds of moronic leaders we have on earth and we don't have any divinely appointed leadership, I would lose faith. And Allah says, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُطْئِفُ فِي الْأَرْضِ It's our desire. Don't lose hope. I have somebody witnessing and he is guiding. And don't worry. They have a plan. They think they're going to eradicate. They think they're going to rob the resources of the human race. Don't worry. My leader is among you. And he is planning. And when he comes, he's going to take their jugulars. And he's going to enslave them. Allah subhanahu wa We're going to establish you. And we will put fear in the likes of Fir'aun and Haman, Allah says in Quran. The sixth verse of Surah Al-Qasas. He said, don't worry, Allah says. Have hope. For I have not abandoned you. So congratulations to the human race. And the next question one would ask is, why is the Imam in Ghayba? Why is the Imam hidden? Should the Imam not be among us? For then certainly we would have more effectiveness and all this chaos on earth would not exist. True. But then what are we? Sheep? Brainless? Foolish? Or do we have the potential to be leaders? Allah sent 124,000 prophets and 12 Imams one light upon another. He guaranteed a scripture that will not be adulterated to judgment day. What about us? Should we all be spectators and expect God to put only his prophets and imams to lead us? Don't we have the free will and the capacity to lead our own people? So Allah put the imam in ghaybah and said, okay, I've given you enough guidance. I've given you enough understanding. Now your objective is to follow and you take charge and you break the shackles of evil empires and you take care of that. And as a result, Allah put the Imam in hiding precisely for this reason, so that he enables our scholars to rise. And it's amazing. When the Imam went into Ghaybat Sughra, he had four purposely to show us that he is now designating that responsibility and that responsibility will be carried. And then you find historically great ulama started coming up, fuqaha that started doing research and now started adjudicating Sharia with the Quran and Ahlul Bayt. Because the Prophet said, I leave you two things, my Quran and my Ahlul Bayt, and they will never separate and follow both of them. In Nitari Konfikum of Fakalin, I leave you two heavy things. So our fuqaha, our ulama, refer to the Quran, Sunnah of the Prophet in his Ahlul Bayt to derive the new situations we have today. And we have Maraja today who have evolved into that level. And Allah says, this is the reason, one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the Imam in, in occultation. This is, I'm not claiming that that is. And of course, the Imam is also under protection by Allah and he's giving the human race a chance and saying, I will leave the Imam among you and I'm going to put the responsibility on your shoulders. And by the way, that's mentioned in Surah Al-Hajj. You know, This verse, the last verse of Surah Al-Hajj is profound. Read it if you want to pay attention. And Allah says, struggle in the way of your Lord, the way he deserves it, for he has chosen you. He's talking to us now. And he says that, follow the religion of Ibrahim, who, called, who was a Muslim, and all those preceding him. So that the Prophet is a witness over you, and you are a witness over the people. So for us to say, why is the Imam in occultation? It's precisely for this reason, that Allah says, I put that responsibility on you as a society, that come among yourselves and bring a few scholars and leaders and lead the world 
and the Imam will, but you take the, the helm and represent the message of God for after Adam all the way to the birth of Imam Mahdi, within that short ghaybah, you have this period of time of great learning of the Imams and the Prophets and the Quran, it is enough for you to fulfill your obligation as moral upright, upright leaders. So just as simple examples of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed our Imam in occultation. Now, if you might say, well, what benefit does the Imam give us when he's in occultation? You know, he's, a, he's behind a cloud, he's behind a wall, he's around us. As I always say, I am 100% certain, 100%, not 99%, 100% certain that in every gathering, the Imam is present. You might say, but how is he multiplicit present if he's one person? Having multiple positions in presence is not an impossibility within the scope of physics and time. Even the messenger who went to Miraj, Subhanalladhi asra bi abadihi layla min al masjid al haram. Allah took the Holy Prophet to the highest stations in paradise, in the heavens, and He showed him the secret. He took him to a place where even Jibreel could not enter. Qaba Kawsaini aw adna. Quran mentions this in the 17th chapter of the Quran. Tell me, during that time, was the earth without a leader? No. Because, because the messenger, they say, moved so rapidly that even Einstein was stunned by that fact that tea was being poured. Jibrail takes him, and by the way, it wasn't a horse with wings. People say Burak was the horse, you know, with wings. It wasn't. It's an interpretation. It's not true. Okay? The Prophet did not get on a horse with wings that had special abilities and then he flew up in space. No. Burak, the root is bark, it's lightning, something of a very speedy, moving environment. Something as a substance that if you have it by Allah, it's like entering a wormhole and you could be on the other side of the universe the next millisecond. The Prophet left and the tea was being poured and the tea, as it's still being poured, the Prophet had already come back and he had done all his transactions with Allah because in the speed of time and light, the Prophet transacted, spoke with all the preceding Prophets. He led prayers in paradise. Allah gave him more injunctions. In fact, the Prophet asked for seven more rak'ats to be added to the prayer that we pray today, the 17 rak'ah. It was all during that period of time. And he came back and the tea was still being poured and the earth was not denied his presence even for a split second. But for the Imam to be in multiple uh, locations is perfectly fine. And my final point is that the Imam's presence among us is that you might say, well, what benefit does he bring? Because you know, there has to be tangibility. Then I would ask you the question, what benefit did the Europeans, the Asians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, I'm talking about them in the Prophet's time, not the ones who colonized later. What benefit did they have for the Prophet to be limited between Mecca and Medina in that Arabian region? What benefit did the world have with Imam Ali salam, and our Imams to be mostly within that region? The furthest was Marv, as you know, Imam Radha salam, who, tra who was pulled to Persia. What benefit did the rest of the world have? The point is that he does not need to be in your living room to give benefit. The mere presence of his on earth is sufficient benefit for all. But you might say, but under that case, he's not visible. In other words, you can't see him. He said, no, he is visible, but not recognizable. He's not invisible. But I'll give you an example. Assuming even he is in that state of invisibility, if you want to use that term, we all know for certain, per the Quran, that shaitan, aka Iblis, Iblis actually, aka shaitan, is among us. The devil is constantly whispering into our ears. We as a human race have no problem accepting that. Yet none of us have seen him in the physical. And we are all convinced, even in the court of law, your honor, oh jury, you know, the devil made me do it. Well, where's the devil? Have you seen him? How can the devil harm you when you haven't seen him? So the simplest answer for that is that if a being that cannot be seen can harm you just by whispering, then by what standard can a person say, 
what benefit does the imam bring to me? This has no merit in fact. It's a good question, but with all due respect, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affects my heart. You might say, well, he is he's in ghaiba. He is the most invisible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is no shape or form, yet he is the most prominent figure in everything that we exist in. So let's not go in that direction to demand tangibility, visibility, okay, in order for us to validate the efficacy of leadership. Leadership functions at many different levels. And in fact, in its highest forms, it is in the state of Qayba. For we are all believing in the Prophet today. And as Muslims, we have to say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And we all say that he is benefiting us because we are Muslims. But we all know that he is, he, his soul has been taken and he is not among us in the sense of the tangible, physical. Although he is shaheed, he is present among us. He is alive, 100%. That's why we send salam to him. But we all know as Muslims that the Prophet is benefiting us. We all know that. By sending salawat to him, salam to him, to his family, it's benefiting us. So let's not go there to say, oh, how does the Imam benefit us when he's not present? That whole proposition doesn't hold much merit, but it's a good question nonetheless. And in conclusion, I would say that the birth of our blessed Imam is reaching a, a state where you will see the evolution of the human race has reached a point today where the world has converged into a village. And with the pandemic now, you're finding depression is very high. Suicide rates are high. Uh, the dispensaries are giving a lot more antidepressants to the human race, more than any time in history. And the pandemic is adding on to that. But rather than us fall depressed because of that, I think it's important for us to find the blessings in the pandemic that Allah has forced the world to slow down, has forced the world to be more introspective, has forced the world to spend more time with their families, has forced the siblings to get to know each other better, has forced in so many ways through this contagion. You have to look at the opportunity. While the negative sides are, we've lost a lot of human beings, a lot, presidents, even leaders of countries that have left this world, but death is imminent anyway, and we now need to practice. So what are we practicing now? Look at the silver lining, more hygiene, more disinfections, okay, less of this filthiness that we were surrounding ourselves with. We have more respect, even now the problem of shaking hands in the Muslim communities in the West is no longer a problem. Our sisters who were having difficulty in corporate America or corporate Canada, where shaking of hands was a big issue, well, guess what? It just went out the window. Because nobody's ever gonna ask you, why don't you shake hands now? You just have to say, hello, how are you? It's a pleasure to see you. Oh, you're a Muslim, why aren't you shaking hands? Thank God, it's become a culture now. How about covering ourselves in the right way? You know, our sisters, I mean, the niqabis are having a field day. The ladies were wearing niqab, they're saying, you know, we were looked down upon. But the irony is, even in Europe, you can't enter without wearing a mask. But they've banned the niqab. No, niqab in Islam is not obligatory. It's a personal choice. It's, it, there's, there's no mention in the Quran about the niqab. But if a woman wants to cover herself and wants to protect herself, it is her right to do so. But now it's a field day for them. They're walking on the streets perfectly, you know, uh, comfortable because they're looking at themselves and look. So the world has converged and evolved into a whole new world in the last three years. And, the, and we will never be the same again. Ever. Our world will be very different. We'll be acutely aware of possibilities and the contagions and all these different variants of diseases that keep mutating and forming into new forms that even after your vaccination, you're not totally immune. So the probability of a pandemic becoming an endemic that is going to remain among us for a very long period of time is here to stay. So that means we're going to now adopt better ways of hygiene better ways of cleanliness, better ways of distancing, better ways of social structures. And I think that's all very positive. See the silver lining in it. And of course, the fact that death has become so prevalent due to diseases, not due to wars, is also 
and a very loud reminder to the human race that death awaits you. This death that you're running away from will meet you. Then you will meet your Lord, who is your witness, and will tell you what you have done. This is a central foundation that we have to take into consideration, especially now. But let's not, therefore, fall into depression. The leadership that Allah has promised, the hope that Allah has given us, and the silver lining that awaits us with opportunities because of what has come should be seized. And don't feel depressed. And don't indulge in these, you know, control substances. They are not necessary for most cases. Some are necessary, but many a times we diagnose each other like, okay, you're ADHD, you know, you, you've got uh, OCD, you know, you've got, you just take a couple of these pills every day, you know, pop them, inshallah, things will be, okay, you'll be balanced. Now we become creatures just purely dependent on the uh, pharmaceuticals, and we need to get out of that. So I'm advising us all, including myself, that if we have this situation, hold on to Allah and hold on to it, not just by doing tasbih, oh God, please get me out of this. No, have hope. Know that Allah created me when I didn't exist. He shaped me when I didn't exist. He sustains me when I don't deserve. And he has given me an eternity that I don't deserve. He's given me family, a world, a universe, a hereafter that I don't deserve. By what reason? Which of my bounties, Allah says, 31 times in Surah Al-Rahman, which of my bounties will you belie me for? Live by that standard. I don't care if you're breathing your last on the bed with the worst sickness. Say, Alhamdulillah, ala kulli ni'ma. Thank you, my Lord, for all the gifts you've given me. For what awaits me after this world is far greater than what I've been given. Live by that standard. Your internal organisms, your body, your fitra will listen to it. It said, this owner of me is talking positive to me. So I'm reacting to this being and I'm responding to this being. When Allah said, Ya ayu latina amanu, alaykum anfusakum. Oh, you believe? Take care of yourselves. Talk to yourself. I know I don't care if there is the worst scenario. Sure, we have this... We have this feeling of total loss and there's nothing I can do and the world is about to collapse. Oh my God. Allah says, don't lose hope in me. Nothing will remain but me. Kullu man alayha fan. Everything will perish. What will remain is God. And we are creation of God. We are owned by him, shaped by him sustained by him and returning to him. Don't worry. There's nothing to worry. Because no matter what happens, in the grave, in Barzakh, on the day of judgment, know that he did not create me for hell. He created me for his love and grace. Live by that. Follow by that. And don't give up. And Allah says, you've understood who I really am. So that's my conclusion to my generation, young generations especially. Depression, you know, you like a girl, the girl likes a boy, he doesn't like me, she doesn't like, oh, that's it, I, I, I might as well just die. The world is collapsing on me. She said no to me. Oh my God, she denied me. Are you, I, I, I no longer want to live. There are eight and a half billion people on earth. When you get married to one, that's a lifetime. You can't marry more than one. It's hard. What are, you, what are you surprised about? It's not like God says on earth, every human being has to marry at least a thousand, you know? So now you've got this headache of marrying a thousand women or a thousand men, you know, until you grow. No, one. Then you have children. Then you have grandchildren. You know how much work is involved? My God, it's an uphill battle. And Allah says, if you missed one, don't get depressed. I see our youth. They talk to me, brother. I'm so depressed, I'm hopeless, I'm ugly, I'm stupid, I'm, I'm poor. You know, I have this little disease on my skin. I, I, you know, no girl is going to accept me. I said, where are you coming from? What are you talking about? Oh, brother, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a damaged goods. I said, damaged goods? Are you kidding me? You are the most priceless thing that exists in the universe. And the devil loves it when you say that. That's exactly what he said about you, your grandfather when he was created. 
He said, this mud creature, hopeless, useless mud creature, Adam and his children, and now we are speaking the words of Iblis? No, don't ever say that. Don't say, oh, I look this way, my nose is this way. You know, I come from that culture and I speak that. Oh, I'm no good. Don't say that. Every human being is chosen and blessed and handpicked to be where they are and savor it, honor it, stand in front of the world and say, I'm the only one on earth who has that, but I'm honored to be that. Don't say, oh, you know what? I, I want to join the whole circle, the bandwagon. I look so different, you know? I'm so different from all of you. Oh my God, I wish I didn't exist. No, you're the gem. And by the way, there are no two human beings who are the same. Even identical twins don't agree on everything. So Allah says, I made you so unique that even your fingertips are different. What? So the birth of Imam Mahdi to me is that driver of my vessel who's holding the stern, who's holding the steering wheel and looking at me with a smile and said, Hassanin, you see the seas are rough? Ships sink, don't worry, I'm holding your ship. Ah, oh, what else do I do? I love it. Every second, <laughs> I'm saying, let me, let me take you one more step. Before Allah takes me, let me take one more step. Oh, but you, you may die, you have a disease. I don't care. At least I'll die with dignity. Or oh, you may get a bullet between your eyes. No problem. At least I'll be a martyr. Yeah, you're not afraid. Why should I pray when God owns me? He made me. He keeps me. And he's taking me back. I'm not going to any Tom, Dick, and Harry fool. I'm going to my Lord. The only one who knows me. The only one who cares for me. The only one who protects me. Should I be worried? But many of us don't believe in that. We really don't believe in that. Many of us think, you know what? As soon as I stop breathing, I'm going to go to hell. And I'm going to burn in there forever. No, you're not. It's very hard to go to hell. You have to work hard to go to hell. You have to be mischievous. You have to be evil. You have to consistently and persistently reject the mercy of Allah if you ever want to enter hell. Who, what, what foolish person would do that? So stop and say to yourself, I'm blessed. And on this blessed birth of our living Imam, I want to be a witness. But when we say, Allahumma kulli waliyik al hujjat ibn al Hasan, we're praying to God that your wali, by your standards, Allahumma kun, by you, li waliyik al hujjah, by, by your leadership of this hujja that protect him, hatta tuskinahu ardaka taw'a wa tumatti'ahu fiha tawila. Give him that power. To, to be in the state of success and pleasure for a long time. Why are we praying for that? Because we're saying to Allah, that's the reason we're on this earth, to fulfill the objective you created us for. We cannot do it without an imam. And even if he's in hiding, even if I never see him till I die, he is in my heart and I will continue to do whatever he wants. And God willing, maybe if I'm dead, and he comes after me, that Allah will give me the opportunity to come back and be among his soldiers. Or even if I'm not, I know that God is merciful and maybe he will make me their neighbors. What better place to live than the neighbors of prophets and the imams? And that's absolutely possible for all of us in Maqam and Mahmoud. Jannatul Firdaus. It's possible, but we have to start now. So I'm giving this message to my young brothers and sisters. Stop contemplating suicide. Stop contemplating depression. Stop contemplating loss. I don't care even if this financial loss. May Allah alleviate our bala through financial loss. Our communities are rich enough. And I know the people are very generous in the world if they know there's a problem. Every time you hear a story on, on, on the internet or on the news, a GoFundMe, sometimes one person, that woman who got hit, the Asian woman in San Francisco, now she's become a spokeswoman for justice and equity for Asian Americans. She's an 80 plus year old woman. She beat this white man with a stick. Good for her. And now GoFundMe raised a million dollars for her and she's become a leader. Can you imagine? You're walking around, don't even speak a word of English, carrying this little cart that you're gonna go shopping. World-class leader representing Asian Americans in America, in your wildest dream, you can't believe that. And there are people who've thrown a million dollars towards you. 
But anything is possible. So don't lose hope and know that despite all this, don't indulge in that. I've heard stories that, you know, this year, we, past year, we didn't have camps. A lot of our youth became very depressed and now they were getting into drugs and now they're imbibing into these horrible drugs. And these drugs that are made in laboratories like fentanyl and carfentanyl, this knocks out a human being in seconds and they're dead. For what reason? Well, I was so dissatisfied with the world. I needed an escape. You know, mom and dad don't get along. I'm a failure. So I want to go into cloud nine. And then this cloud nine takes you permanently to the next world. We need to stop this. And we need to say it clearly that if you knew the value of what you possess by being existent on earth, I promise you, if all the wealth in the universe was taken and put on one side, it cannot purchase you. That's the value each one of us has. May Allah bless you, inshallah. وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين I don't know if we have time for a Q&A um, we can jump in uh, Thank you Abraham. so much Haj Hassanain for your insightful lecture We'll now have a short nasheed in celebration of tonight's occasion by Brother Farid Al-Najafi Please go to tinyurl.com forward slash ace questions to submit your questions for our Q&A, which we will get to right after this nasheed. <laughs> مهدی آمد آن که سر تا پای او 
کربه یه جان تمام عالم است مهدی آمد مهدی آمد مهدی آمد مهدی آمد مهدی آمد مهدی آمد Thank you, Brother Al-Najafi, for your beautiful nasheeds that we've been able to enjoy tonight. Jazakallah. I'd now like to start our Q&A with Haj Hassanayn. Also, questions related to tonight's lecture are preferred. You can also send your questions on Instagram at Ace Online. So the first question that we have here um, is you mentioned the story of Imam Mahdi's mother. Isn't there another narr narration that she was from Africa? Would you appreciate, oh, would appreciate any insight on this? Thank you. Right, there is, there is a theory that um, she was of Nubian background and that is very possible, uh, you know, that she has um, Nubian background, but from historical analysis and asking experts in the field, they have narrated that the, uh, the Roman princess who came actually seems to be more viable for a couple of reasons. Number one was that she was actually a relative of Isa alayhi salam and the whole prescription of Imam Mahdi with Imam, uh, you know, with uh, Prophet Isa alayhi salam being the finalities of the branch of Ibrahim alayhi salam on two sides from Ishaq and Ismail is very, uh, you know, um, important within that, uh, the system that Allah has created as far as the blessed tree that will um, bring justice and equity on earth. So the proposition is that uh, there's historical evidence to show that. But does the Imam have, for example, African blood in him? Absolutely. Um, our ninth Imam was definitely uh, black uh, skin colored. Uh, Imam Radha, as you know, his wife was an uh, African a Nubian, and um, actually more than 60% of our Imams had married African uh, slave, in fact, slave women uh, who they emancipated, and they were the mothers of our Imams. And that's a very, very powerful point to make, especially in today's world, where, um, you know, Black Lives Matter is such a, such a, you know, important topic where the black population is subject to so much tyranny historically that alhamdulillah this is hopefully going to become institutionalized where the world will respect all skin colors and not one group of skin colors and i think the imam coming in whatever skin color he will come in is definitely going to play a huge role in the finality of the establishment of justice on earth Thank you so much for that response. We have one more question. One moment, please. Um, the next question is, what's the biggest thing we can do to prepare for the Imam's arrival and hasten it? The biggest thing we can do is promote justice, equity, tawasu bil haq wa tawasu bil sabr. Pro promote justice, equity, good relationships, unity in the community, and more God consciousness. The more we do that, the more we're preparing for the Imam. Let's stop getting into unnecessary fights. Our communities are riddled with gossip, backbiting, fault finding. Everyone that we do is one step away from the preparation of the Imam. Each time we find faults in others and cause uh, chaos in the family or in the community, or we cause fitna, even in leadership. Some communities are split because a few want to break the community and cause them to follow a different group. And then the next thing, one group is fighting another group. Those are the people generally who are fighting the Imam. Those who work towards unity, who work towards educating the world, who speak the truth in inviting people towards Allah, who exercise patience, 
who promote the truth and they don't sell the truth for any price are the ones who are preparing for the imam. And we need to do that for the imam because I know for a fact, according to the Quran, that if we indulge in that, we will naturally gravitate towards the imam when he reappears. Thank you so much for your responses. Uh, that will conclude our Q&A. Thank you so much, Hajj Hassanain, for accepting our invitation and for taking the time to be with us virtually tonight. We wish you continued success, inshallah. Thank you to all of you who tuned into tonight's program. Don't forget about our upcoming event with Sayyid Asad Jafri this Thursday night at 9 p.m. right here on our YouTube channel. Please make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you can always follow our programs. You can also stay up to date with ACE by following us on social media at ACE Online and signing up for our mailing list at tinyurl.com forward slash ACE Mail. Please stay tuned to our accounts for information regarding our month of Ramadan programming. Thanks again for joining us and have a good night. عالم برای تو جان ها فدای تو ای نور کبریا یا صاحب الزمان عالم برای تو جان ها فدای تو ای نور کبریا یا صاحب الزمان یا صاحب Oh, oh, oh.